I'll shift into some advice for many of the startups who are here and who are going to be participating in the accelerator about how to navigate in this environment. Um, and then to have an energetic end ending, I'm gonna eat a piece of chocolate that my wife gave me for good luck before we started. And then we'll have an energetic ending and open it up for Q&A. So hopefully, uh, since I can't see anybody nodding, hopefully you all agree and we'll move into this from here. So first a secret, um, I'm not a doctor. I've only played one on TV. I do have a Juris doctor, but I'm a recovering lawyer. I haven't practiced in a long, long time. So just to make sure that you get that straight from the outset, but I have been in venture capital and investing for over 25 years, um, starting with the idea that we could use technology to address broken business process. And when we came to healthcare, we realized that there was enough broken process to last us a lifetime. And so that's where we've been focused now for close to 20 some odd years. And at Sevenware Ventures, we are driven to support entrepreneurs who are looking to build companies that allow us all to address the hassles that we face in healthcare. What we do is we focus on what we call journey mapping and we spend time understanding those hassles and challenges and we try to build informed and connected health consumers. And one of the things that kind of give us a sense of the importance of what it is we're doing is what we've just come through in terms of, of thinking about the pandemic. And if you had to imagine a time that we were told you can't go to the doctor's office, that you can't associate with friends, that you really shouldn't be going to the hospital for any procedures you've had scheduled, it would be hard to imagine a time like this. And yet that's what we've gone through for the better part of 18 months. And when we think about what has happened during that time, we've seen an acceleration in a number of consumer focused remote care options driven mostly by what we call generally as telehealth. Now, from a telehealth standpoint, I, I wanna say that it's more than just the idea of having a video visit. So there's very little that I could diagnose about Dr. Goldman, um, if you he were here on video with me, um, through this type of, of interaction. But what you can do is you can start to inquire and have a dialogue and establish a bit of a, an understanding and a relationship that hopefully can lead to some way to address the situation that's being presented through that video connection. But what I think we're gonna see in terms of coming through this pandemic um, is a little bit of a push and pull um, on what's happening with regard to telehealth. At the start of this public health emergency, there were some very important changes that were put through by Congress that allowed telehealth to blossom and see a remarkable increase, almost tenfold increase in terms of utilization by consumers over the course of the pandemic. First change was, is that it allowed for parity in reimbursement between telehealth visits and physical visits. And as I mentioned, physical visits weren't happening. And so you needed to find a way to allow for providers to still deliver care and yet still get reimbursed for those services. And so there was parity in terms of reimbursement. And there was also this opportunity for doctors to practice across state lines. And that's something that was not allowed prior to the pandemic, but was opened up during the course of the public health emergency. Now happening today on another forum, um, a conference that um, has been going on, I guess, for a couple of days this week and into next is the American Telemedicine Association Conference. And a lot of the discussion that's going on there is about what's going to happen when the public health emergency expires and will some of those changes continue? And that's going to be an uphill battle in Congress because there's some concern about fraud and abuse in terms of using telehealth and being able to monitor whether or not the services that are being delivered are at the level and quality that should be reimbursed. And in addition, the other challenge that exists is that this cross state line practice of medicine has created a lot of stress for state medical societies, uh, many of whom have objected to that occurring and wanna see the licensure rules continue as they did prior to the pandemic. So there's some concern that telehealth will reach a cliff 
and start to fall off dramatically if those rules aren't changed. Now, I believe that we'll see, in, in my view, and this is free advice, so you get what you pay for, but in my view, very, uh, a large number of commercial insurers will continue to reimburse um, at rates that are less than, but still comparable with what you'd see for a face-to-face -face visit because they recognize that the convenience of providing care is so important and to allow providers to practice at the top of their license by allowing many routine things to occur using telemedicine that we weren't able to do previously when it wasn't as prevalent. I'll give an example. Uh, my daughter lives in Los Angeles, um, where I know many of you also live. And what she finds is the common experience that you probably have. It takes 45 minutes to drive and park at the doctor's office. You wait 15 to 20 minutes in the doctor's office if you're lucky. And then you get to go into an exam room where you wait another 10 or 15 minutes. And literally for her, she's going to get a prescription renewal that requires an examination. And that takes five minutes. She has her prescription sent electronically to a pharmacy that she stops at on her drive back to work. And that whole process takes well over two hours for her. But during the course of the pandemic, what she found is they could do all of that for her in a visit like this in five minutes. And she's going to be challenged to go back to the way it was before because it was just so convenient. It was such a great consumer experience that she'll continue to fill her prescriptions where she can online. And I think that we'll see that pressure from consumers demanding these types of changes continue. Now, the other thing to think about is the evolution of telehealth. I don't know how many of you have been in to see a teller at a bank lately, but it's been years since I've been in to see one. And I don't think of what I do on my phone as being mobile banking or telebanking. I think of it as banking. It's a way that I get a service that I want. And with healthcare, I think the same is gonna be true. Telehealth is becoming health. But in order to take the next steps forward to do the things that it needs to do, a few things have to happen. One is, is that telehealth has to be informed. And to do that, you need to have more information that can be shared with a provider at the other end of the screen, if you will, um, to allow them to have the ability to diagnose more accurately. So how do you do that? Well, there's a number of digital tools that can be used to provide better insights and knowledge to the provider so that they understand what's occurring with regard to an individual when they see her or him on the screen. And that comes from use of tools like connected blood pressure monitors and connected, tele, uh, connected thermometers and connected glucometers and connected scales and the like that allowed the fidelity of information to be passed to the provider on the screen. In fact, part of the industrial logic for the merger between Livongo and Teladoc that was mentioned in my introduction was because Livongo was capturing your body's vital narrative and being able to share that through the cloud with those who are monitoring your health and wanting to help you move to a healthier state. And so more and more of, of these wearables and solutions that we can use to better measure where you are on your personal health journey are going to be applied in terms of being able to deliver health through a video screen or health over a phone or health through chat, but it's all going to be about the delivery of health and not just about a video interaction. Now, what else we start to see in terms of this this changes that are going to occur is you have to think about verticalization of health and areas where you start to see some of the things that need to occur in terms of being able to provide better access to healthcare services, as well as better services for those who have been challenged to get them. Let me start with an example of our senior population. As you may know, 10,000 people are aging into Medicare every day. And what you find with regard to that population is that as they age, they are taking multiple medications. We're living longer. Our life expectancy has more than doubled since the late 1800s to where we are today. 
And as we live longer, we're having more conditions that need to be treated. But to do that, it requires you to go in for multiple office visits, as well as to get multiple prescriptions. And seniors are desiring to live healthier and independently at home longer. I can't think of many of us who would want to put some of our loved ones who are seniors into congregate care facilities because those were petri dishes for COVID-19. And many people unfortunately passed because they were in those types of facilities. So how do we allow seniors to age at home? We're going to be providing more modalities that allow us to measure health. Now, while some of those will be wearables, others will be collecting data in an ambient fashion. So think about wall mounted devices or think about tools that might look like a vase or might look like a, a countertop device that can also be used for video interaction uh, where seniors can start to interact, but also their vital signs are being captured. Respiratory rate, evaluation for fall risks. In some cases, they'll be able to now start to provide other types of information that can be used in that fashion to allow for a better picture of what their health status is. We're also starting to see wearables like tattoos that basically work off your body heat and don't need to be recharged, but can be worn for a period of time that will collect a large number of vital signs. So things that are easy to put on and things that are easy to use, but we start to see this transition in a telehealth context that allows for that fidelity of information to be utilized and shared with those who are going to monitor your health and take care of you. Now that leads to the other aspect of this, which is it may not be a doctor who's providing that type of, of view. It could be a care coach, it could be a physician extender, and it could be a nurse. And so we're starting to see more and more individuals who will get involved in care over time in terms of being able to monitor health for that population. With this, we'll also start to see new ways of collecting clinical data that's used for research. And this is another important area and prong for utilization of telehealth. We're starting to see more distributed clinical trials and use of these types of tools that might be provided for remote patient monitoring, but also utilized for services that are delivered in the context of your home without having to go into the clinic. This also provides the advantage of being able to bring in more individuals and more disparate information, uh, information from a diverse population that can participate in trials. And being able to use those same type of modalities that can be used to deliver care in combination with things like home-based testing, easy collection of blood tests, easy collection of other types of diagnostics that can be shared with the clinical trial site um, will allow for more fidelity. And we've started to see some very interesting companies like Science37 that are going public based on this type of, of knowledge that can be captured and utilized in that fashion. Another area to highlight for you is around value-based care. Some of you may know that the model of care that's delivered principally in this country is called fee-for-service. So the more services a healthcare provider delivers, the more they're paid. But many health plans are shifting towards a model that's used in Medicare Advantage, for example, with our senior population. And that's value-based care, where a population is covered by a certain type of reimbursement rate, depending on where they are with regard to their healthcare status. So a bit higher reimbursement for those who may be sicker than those who are not. And as a health plan or as a provider who's part of this capitated arrangement, um, you are going to be held accountable for providing care at a certain cost. In that model, delivering lots of services makes that individual consumer a cost center, not a revenue center. So how can you try to help keep people healthy when they leave the four walls of a hospital or leave a doctor's office? And the way to do that is to provide the type of monitoring services that will allow you to deliver care everywhere, at work, at home, when you're on the road and traveling. And you can do that from some of the types of connected modalities that will be part of the future of what these healthcare experiences provide. Now, I promised there would be 
some advice for the startups out there. And I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the key elements that I think you should be focused on as you're delivering services into this type of marketplace. But first, a corny joke. Um, what do you call three friends in Silicon Valley? A startup. And so for those startups out there that have three friends or more involved, let me tell you a little bit about some of the experiences that we've had at Seven Water and with some of the companies that I've been privileged to work at that will need to be present in order to thrive in this type of environment. So I talked about some of the modalities that are going to be used at a consumer level. But one of the key challenges is how do you get consumers to use them? And the challenge here around consumer engagement, that really is what will be the blockbuster drug of the 21st century. How do you get people to engage and take better care of themselves? And the way we think about doing that is to fit within someone's life flow. So I'll provide an example from our experience at Livongo. What we did was, is we provided a glucometer to individuals with diabetes. It doesn't sound very novel or exciting. Glucometers have been around for many, many years. But what we did was we connected it to the cloud. And we also provided more information to the individual when they use that glucometer than they receive from, let's call it a dumb box that they might have been using before. By essentially pairing a smartphone with a glucometer, we had connectivity. And 24 by 7, an individual could interact with a care coach or a nurse if they needed a nurse or escalate their care to their provider if that's what was necessary, just by having the ability to press a button on that smart glucometer. They could also use a companion app. But what we were doing is we were fitting into that consumer's life flow. They were used to using a glucometer to measure their blood sugar. But when all that came up was a number that told you what your blood glucose level was, it wasn't really giving you much information. And you might not have understood the context of where you were in your journey during the course of your health experience. Maybe you had the flu, maybe you didn't eat right, maybe you had a donut for breakfast in the morning and that's why your blood sugar was high. And, and objectively, you might know that that was the case, but you might not understand what that's doing to your trend of your blood sugar over time. And the way that we were treating individuals with diabetes is everyone was treated as a statistic based on their average blood sugar over 90 days. But using Gary as my example again, um, his blood sugar might be in control and averaged over 90 days. And, and I could have the same average, but my blood sugar might amp up and ramp down and amp up and ramp down. And what I'm doing is I'm revving and slowing my engine in ways that might be damaging to my health where Gary is in control and not doing the same. And so how do you provide that type of insight and knowledge to someone between doctor's office visits? So you do that by finding something consumers love to engage with and that they get value from. And in that context, what we had was a net promoter score or a measure of how much consumers like what it is that you're delivering to them that was in the 60s, which is comparable to what Apple has for their products. So start with something that consumers love to use and will engage with. The second is get them to an engage in a way that will improve the outcomes of their health. So when we were improving their blood sugar, we were keeping people out of the emergency room because we were avoiding hyper or hypoglycemic events that could be dangerous for their health. And we also didn't require them to have unnecessary office visits. We were literally able to say, you know what, you're doing fine. Rather than checking your oil at, at 6,000 miles, you don't need to come in. Your engine is fine. And we could do the same thing for your health. And so we were able to avoid costly visits or costly ER visits. And that delivered great outcomes, better health at a lower cost. And so that third element is return on investment. You have to be better than the alternative and provide a positive return on investment to the sponsor of the cost of care. And so the sponsor in this case was a health plan or a self-insured employer who was willing to pay us for delivering this service in ways that allowed us to continue to do the things that we thought that we can do better for, better for the consumer and doing that remotely. So in terms of the types of things that you need to think about, 
for what it is that you're doing with regard to delivery of offerings, you need to make sure that those three elements are present. And if you do, that's the secret sauce. So in summary, with regard to thinking about telehealth in a post-COVID envi environment, few things to keep in mind. First, it's not telehealth. It's about the way in which we deliver health in a multimodal fashion. And you have to be prepared to play in this new environment. The second thing is, make sure that when you're doing that, you're thinking about how you fit into workflow. If your offering is for a provider, how does it fit in their workflow and where is it in the reimbursement structure? Because if it can't be reimbursed, it's not likely gonna be bought by providers. And if it's on the consumer side, think about how you fit into the life flow and make sure that you're delivering value to your sponsor. So with that, I think I'm at just about time in terms of this talk, I'd like to stop and open it up for your questions and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. So I see a couple of questions here in the Q&A section. Um, the first one is, what are the relationships between digital health, telehealth, and smart health? So I'm not sure I know um, the difference between smart health and not so smart health. Um, hopefully, the services that you're getting will be coming from licensed providers or licensed services that are smart and not smart. Um, so that term may not mean the same to me. So David, if you want to just give me a little bit of clarity there. But I think about, as I, I hope my, my talk provided, this notion that, that digital health and telehealth are all part of the same system, which is multimodal delivery of health. I do think that what we're going to see over time is the opportunity to use these various solutions that exist in terms of being able to deliver the right services to the right individual at the right time. Something that we called uh, Junior Jitty when we were at Allscripts, Just Right, Just Time Information, but here it's Just Right, Just Time Health. The second question I have comes from Jason, who talks about his company that's developing extremely advanced wearables for tracking a wide range of metrics, um, but they don't have an ability to bill for the device and therefore they're concerned that doctors are less likely to do it. So their question is, how do you get the technology billable? And I'll give you a, um, an opportunity here um, to learn a little bit of what we did at Livongo. Um, we did not charge for our glucometer. Now we were in a place where glucometers were actually reimbursable as durable medical equipment. And there were codes that provided for that. But we went to health plans and to providers um, as well as self-insured employers and we offered them a service. Now, many employers are used to paying for healthcare services per employee or per dependent per month. And we went with, to them with a different value proposition. We told them that they would only pay for those who were engaged in using that service. So rather than paying us for a lot of people who didn't use something, you only paid us for people who were using it. And if you weren't seeing value from it and that the consumer wasn't seeing value from it, they weren't gonna use it and you don't have to pay. And so that month by month billing, however, led us to be able to engage with a lot of people who wanted to use the service and that's who uh, was paying for it. So I think when you look at your solution, if you think about ways to incorporate into a services offering that you can be paid for monthly, only for the people who are using it, where it's gonna deliver value back to the providers, I think that that will be the best way for you to approach it. So hopefully that was appropriate for you. Um, next question that I see is, um, what do you do with regard to enterprise leaders reluctant to adopt solutions not invented here? Um, and, and often they're legacy vendors who are just blocking innovation by saying it's on, on their roadmap, uh, when, when in effect they don't have anything useful. Um, that is really a, a challenge, Matthew, um, with regard to the nature of offerings in the, in the market today. Um, I think that a lot of large health enterprises, unfortunately, have, have found that 
they've spent so much money with some of the incumbents that it's just easier for them to wait to see if something's going to come along on that roadmap, as opposed to using something that is um, that is more innovative and a little bit on the cutting edge. And what I think that that you're going to find is that you're going to need to go to organizations that are a bit more innovative. Um, there are many health systems who have actually found that there are um, benefits to them being out front and being innovative and to start there and to work with them as opposed to trying to break into some of those that might be laggards but might be followers if others took this on. Now, one thing that we had done in our journey at Livongo, uh, so we started with self-insured employers as opposed to starting with providers. As we started to bring on more and more individual employees and they talked to their doctors about what we were doing and the health plan started to see what we were doing, we started to get buy-in from them. Literally during the course of the pandemic, many providers were coming to us to say, I can't see my patients. I want to help them manage their health. Can you provide them with a Livongo solution so that we can have a dialogue and be tracking their blood pressure, or their blood sugar, or their weight, or to work with them on their behavioral health? And so those were things that we were able to do in order to be able to deliver them information they needed, David, in response to your question, to make better health decisions because they had the knowledge that they needed in order to provide insights that would be able to guide the types of decisions that they were being made. So Matthew, I hope that I answered your question as well. Um, Doug uh, has a question. Um, how do you see AI and machine learning fitting into telehealth? Uh, is there low hanging fruit? Uh, what area might be adopted first? For example, intakes forms and diagnosis scheduling, um, healthcare forms, notes, and others. Um, so Doug, I have a bias. Um, and my bias is that um, I prefer real intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence. And I think that there's challenges with regard to artificial intelligence. Uh, there was a saying in accounting when, when I was trained as an accountant eons ago, um, garbage in, garbage out. And likewise, if you don't have the right data and the right types of information guiding the algorithms that are built, unfortunately, you might be making bad decisions. With that as a caveat, um, I do think that certainly in terms of routine issues, um, routine challenges, like collection of intake forms, like collection of, of medical history, things where you can now start to get guided collection of information and save time for practice um, is a good place to start seeing machine learning used so that you can have an interaction that's based on the answer to this question. It will guide you to the next question, the next. And there are a number of tools and services that do that in market today. I do think um, to the question earlier about decision support that we will start to see more and more use of artificial intelligence to guide decision making. Um, there's been a lot of progress um, in radiology as an example for reading images where now some of the artificial intelligence and machine learning can read images in a way that's almost better than what the human eye can do and better than some radiologists. And so you'll start to see some greater support with regard to offerings along those lines. One other question that, that came up, in, and I may take this as um, the last question <clears throat> regarding um, Amazon getting into healthcare. Um, and my view is, is that I think it's great. I think competition is great. Um, Amazon has a number of capabilities that they're bringing. They have tremendous cloud services. They have tremendous logistics capabilities. And so when you start to think about areas that they play in, for example, around pharmacy, their ability to deliver medications to your door um, within a short period of time and to do it less expensively than some of the alternatives is terrific. Now, there is always gonna be a place for a doctor or a health system because procedures are needed and the laying of hands is going to be appropriate for delivery of care. But there are other areas where being able to use 
digital delivery, tele-delivery, or what I call multimodal delivery of care um, that Amazon will be able to excel at. And so you haven't seen them expand into delivery of human-based services. It's more product-based services. But on the product side for durable medical equipment and medications, I think they're going to be a very important force to be dealt with. So with that as my stopping point, um, I'd like to thank you all for the great questions and thank you for the opportunity to have spoken with you today. And should you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me, lee at sevenwireventures.com. Best wishes to all of you and enjoy the rest of the conference.